Working at the Bad Bug Flea Depot was a pretty sweet deal. I did two 12s on the weekend, and the boss was super flexible during the week in that if I clocked in, I got paid. But if I didn't show up, I didn't. He told me not to go over 40 hours because he wasn't offering benefits, but otherwise it was up to me if I wanted money or not. If time permitted after classes and I wanted to, then I'd stop in for an hour or two, usually working register if there was a rush, but mostly booth returns and cleanup, which I didn't mind, except for bathrooms. People are disgusting. Weekends offered a steady flow of patrons who quickly got lost in the maze of cubicles, displays, and shelves loaded with the kind of junk that doesn't work out as impulse buys in a yard sale. Mostly they browsed, slowly and lazily, so interaction was generally as brief as pulling price tags and asking if it was cash or card. This would normally be prime time to keep up on materials for school, be it reading or debating my chances of letting AI write my paper or not, except I didn't work alone. Also, I've got a very average streak going with my grades, and excelling at this point would only instigate suspicion. Cody was my age, 22, and though I was the one putting the community service into my college education, I guarantee she'd be signing my checks if she applied herself. She lived with her grandma and I lived with my folks, and if this was the only work and only money either of us intended to make in our near futures, we'd be in those positions for some time to come. Working at the Bad Bug Flea Depot was a pretty sweet deal, but the boss? He wasn't offering benefits any more than he offered competitive wages. Then again, the level of work that went into any of this, however, we were still managing to rip him off. Daniel? She hadn't caught me daydreaming. My mind was a complete blank. It came as a surprise to myself and I functioned enough to slide my eyes to the right and look at her. Lock it. I'm doing aisle sweep. Lock the door so nobody else came inside while she checked to make sure all our thrifty shoppers had cleared out is what this was shorthand for. I did my do door duty and then tugged the chain of the open sign to extinguish the neon. I hadn't realized it was time to close and that, my friends, is the calling card of a pretty sweet deal. I had returned to the register and was counting the day's cash when Cody approached. She had a good body and that was one of the first things I'd noticed about her. While she considered herself fat, I found her to be perfect and not looking sickly thin or trailer trash double wide. No, she was pudgy in all the right places and squishy looking in the best places. Her eyes were the lightest hazel, and her face had these freckles that she either referred to as moles in training or cancer seeds. Needless to say, she was not as much a fan of them as I was. Finally, her curly strawberry blonde hair, except she called it dirty blonde and claimed there was no red in it as she was not a ginger. Currently, she was fiercely scratching at it with one hand when I asked if everything was alright. She didn't catch on until I gestured this activity and she stopped, shrugged, and said she was fine. Hey, come here. Cody beckoned me, but I murmured something about counting drawer, but even I wasn't interested. Got it. Fucking rich. Daniel. She always said my full name. Never Dan or Danny. This time, it was authoritative in tone, so I let the money fall, disorganized into the drawer, and bumped it closed with my belly as I responded, Yes, mother. Based on the aisle down which she led me, I already knew where we were going. Find some new vinyl to steal? I called out after her as she was three booths ahead and already not waiting. I liked music, but Cody loved it, and it didn't matter what it was. 80s hair band or 20s big band and everything in between. One of the benefits that was included when he worked at the Bad Bug Flea Depot was that you saw a great stock rotation in albums as the trend of collecting records was on the rise. I rounded the pegboard wall and she jump scared me from within the black light lit booth lined with either vinyl on display or framed band posters. I don't steal them, she corrected me with a thrown knuckle to the arm, one that stung. She pulled her punches as much as she called me Danny. I borrow them, like Blockbuster and shit. Her fist uncurled and went back to furiously clawing through her scalp. I winced at how roughly she did this. That's movies, dipshit. Blockbuster video, right in their title. A pause and then, you 
Okay, up top? And I gestured again. She froze the action, looked embarrassed, and dropped her hand. Yeah, I... I don't know. It's like I got this song stuck in my head, or static, or something. Something, I thought. And in that moment, was grateful she didn't punch me again for the name-calling. Anyway, I only borrow. Unless they're good, she flashed me her smile. Then I steal them. She told me to look at this and shoved a chunky Edison-style record into my hands. These were thicker and thus slightly heavier than your standard vinyl, though Cody had also taught me that they were made of wood flour and china clay and that you had to be careful cleaning them. I didn't recognize the song title, Earworm, but I caught on quickly that Cody was showing this to me for its record label art. On the right side was a grim reaper of sorts, skull face hooded and robed with zombie perfect undead hands barely coated with flesh. Opposite him, and with the spindle hole left between them, was a woman in a lovely nightgown and long black hair, but her face was also a skull, and her revealed arms led to withered hands as well. Below them and the song title were a crude table with a player on it as if the two were sampling music together, and carved beautifully across the top between them were the words, Grimophone Record. Badass, am I right? Cody exclaimed, and her hand was back at her head, scratching. Sure, if you're into that sort of macabre stuff. I wasn't. I scratched my head, unsure of what else to say. Oh, I know what you're into. When I'm flipping through milk crates of records, I've seen you going through the Playboy stacks. Hey, they have fascinating articles. She rolled her eyes at this. Plus, a bit of bush and silver dollar-sized nipples. I mean, you just don't see that these days. Gross, she scoffed, but kept her head down, looking at the unique record label. That's when I noticed she had broken skin and her hair had been plucked free. Speaking of gross, I hope you weren't trying on hats or something, because if you have lice... Like a contagious yawn, I felt myself itching at my own scalp. When I noticed, I stopped. Shut up, Daniel. That's not funny. She glared at me and I stammered in response. She pulled her hand free and looked at it with the same disgust she had given me. What's wrong? I asked, and it felt weird to do so. I don't... I don't know, it's... She was flustered. Her hand reached up and a conscious effort was made to pull it away. I've got this... song... something. It's stuck in my head. But it's not a song, more of a sound, like it's... itchy... You know when someone itches their nose and you feel like you must scratch yours? It's like itchy inside, and so I scratch outside. She prolonged meeting my eyes with her own, clearly afraid I would judge her. I didn't want her to feel that way, so I tapped the record. Earworm. Then I pointed to her head. You've got an earworm. It helps me if I listen to the song, but if you don't know what it is in your head... I took a second to look around and again went back to the album in her hand. We could check this out, get something else poking around in your brain. Cody nodded and caught her hand going up to her head and directed it to rub the back of her neck instead. Yeah, she said. Yeah, sure, there's a, there's a player here, but I think we need an extension cord. Awkwardly, I threw out a couple of finger guns with a click-click sound from my mouth before I headed back to the front. Halfway there, I caught myself again scratching at my head, except it wasn't that she had gotten into it. Not like she normally does, at least. No, this was different. Inside my mind, hell, within my skull, was that fuzzy popping sound you only ever got from a vinyl album. Some love it, others think it's distracting or dirty, the way it whispers and crackles over the music. Except, right now, it was in my head. Literally, I thought, because I swore I could feel it. A scratchy sensation on the inside of my skull as a fizzy feeling, like getting goosebumps, rippled over my gray matter. The occasional audible pop from vinyl? Here it felt like a pinprick, and I had this insatiable urge to get at it because it felt itchy, but I couldn't get through my own head. I was scratching again, hard. I muttered, fuck, and tore my hand away. I was at the front desk, just standing there, scratching. I huffed around to the back and clutched the extension cord there as if I were pissed at it. The sound returned, but not only in my head, but from down the aisle I'd just come from. I knew there was an outlet on a nearby support pole, but didn't think Cody had moved the record player there. Did you find something? 
I called out, thinking maybe she had discovered another way to power it. Maybe it had some old corroding D-cell batteries in it, but still, I hung on to the cord as I began my trek back to the booth. The scratchy sound was getting louder the closer I got. Cody? I said, hopefully loud enough to get over the noise. Cody, did you find something? A senseless question, I thought, because obviously she had, or it wouldn't sound like a record player working towards that first track on the album. Only steps away now, and I felt pain on my head where I'd scratched open my own skin. I paused, pulled my hand away, and sure enough, the slightest bit of blood was there on my fingernails. What the fuck? I couldn't finish. I couldn't concentrate. Fuck. The record was so loud, or was it the goddamn sound on my own head? I practically stomp-stepped the last bit of distance to the booth, rounded it, and began, Cody! I froze. Tatters of ancient robe unnaturally shimmered and looked more like it flowed underwater than blew in a breeze. It enveloped with its hood a dirty-looking skull with his eye sockets focused on his work. His hands, undead skin stretched past its breaking point with bony fingers poked from their tips, were working the record player. It was a true-to-form match to the ghoul on the gramophone record label Cody had shown me. My mouth gaped as I saw her head, Cody's head, severed and set upon the record player platter and spinning to the speed as worked by one hand of the gramophone ghoul. The top of her head had been sheared off, cleanly cut away like a cross-section to look into her skull. The thing's other hand, with its index finger outstretched, scratched over her exposed brain as her head rotated. It was the needle, and his mouth was the speaker. He worked his jawbone and the volume of the sound, the same sound as the fuzzy, popping, itching sound I'd heard in my own head, raised and lowered. The extension cord fell from my hand, and besides the urine spilling down my leg, I was frozen. The gramophone ghoul noticed me, turned his head slowly to gaze upon me. He left Cody's half-head to tumble free from the player, and was on me with a speed I hadn't even registered. Something, his hand, held the top of my scalp in place, and his other brought up the vinyl Cody had shown me, the one with this thing's label. Had the thickness of the record always tapered off to such a fine edge? I found myself wondering as it passed from out of my view, and I felt it used, spinning, to slice open my own head, through the skin and bone, and once it touched the brain and began slivering through it, things stopped, sense make, scratching, my head scratches.